Okay, thank you very much, Lynn. I want to thank uh, Rick Furman and Mort Coleman for the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, so this presentation will have to do with genetic uh, alterations in CLL cells and precursors of CLL cells. Uh, but it'll be more of a functional uh, discussion as opposed to a discussion of the specific uh, locations of the lesions, for example. Um, and the messages here are the same messages that you would have for virtually any other cancer. Uh, that is that first, that there's the development of, cancer, of CLL requires a series of um, genetic uh, events, um, some inherited, uh, some somatic, um, and um, exactly what these are in CLL is still unfolding, uh, but I think there's enough information to say that this process clearly occurs in CLL. Uh, the second is that once the transformation event has occurred, uh, the progression of the disease uh, and the worsening for the patient's standpoint is a function of new abnormalities that occur, again, like any other cancer. And then the third is that there are promoting events that allow for um, these uh, uh, lesions to occur. Um, and the promoting events will basically be discussed by Jan Berger and uh, uh, Tom Kipps uh, in the context of what happens to a CLL cell on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'll basically spend most of my time on the first two. Um, I, as I said, a lot of these lesions are not known at this point in time, but the technologies have improved so much and I, that there's so much information being generated so rapidly that I think it's highly likely that certainly in the next decade, most of these uh, blanks will be filled in. Okay, so let's start with development. Um, so um, I think it's clear that there is a hereditated, a hereditated inherited predisposition to develop CLL. Um, and uh, we're familiar with most of these, but just to go over them quickly. Uh, first is the racial association. It's a disease of the West, not of the East. And uh, people from Asia, when they migrate actually to the US, as an example, they retain this uh, inherited susceptibility to develop CLL. Um, the other uh, uh, fact that's emerged uh, in the past decade is the difference uh, that genetics probably plays in the influence of ionizing radiation in the development of CLL. Um, so as we know, after the bombings in World War II, there was an increase in virtually all cancers except CLL. Uh, and uh, that was thought, that was interpreted as an indication that ionizing radiation isn't a, a potential cause. Uh, the same thing happened in a different context in Chernobyl uh, later, and we see a very high incidence now of CLL in that area. So again, I think it suggests that if you have the same insult and you have two genetic populations, uh, one of which is more predisposed than the other to developing the disease, that you'll, you'll get the phenotype. Um, and last, uh, this issue of familial CLL. It's clearly the uh, uh, lymphoid malignancy that is most uh, likely to aggregate in families. Um, and uh, family members of CLL will have not only CLL, but also other non-Hodgkin's lymphomas, and in, also other cancers, in particular epithelial cancers. Okay, so that's kind of historical stuff that we, we all know. Uh, over the past five or six years, there have been a series of uh, uh, relatively large uh, population studies performed to try and identify loci in the genome of CLL cells or in the patients of, of individuals uh, that develop CLL, looking for uh, genetic polymorphisms that may be associated with CLL. Um, and this is a st and probably the leader in this field is a fellow, Richard Holston, in, in England. Uh, and his group has shown over a series of uh, different studies uh, that there are probably at least 10 single uh, po uh, nucleotide polymorphisms um, that are genetically inherited that are associated with the higher incidence of CLL. Um, these, this is the list. The list is not that important, I don't think, for our discussion, but the principle is. The other thing to notice is that the, the risk of developing CLL for one of these is relatively small, uh, suggesting that CLL is a polygenic disease, and it's really the interaction of multiple different uh, um, genetic issues that lead to the, the disease. Um, another set of experiments that have been published in the past year that are really very provocative, um, they are yet to be uh, 
uh, repeated by others, so it's still unclear if these are reproducible data, but they are published in an excellent journal, and the, the results are very consistent with this idea of a, uh, a multiple hit model for the development of CLL. And these are studies done by a group in, uh, in Japan in which they isolated CD34 positive, 38 negative hematopoietic stem cells from CLL patients, and then compared those with uh, cells from uh, normal individuals uh, by taking the two populations and injecting them into A lymphoid mice. These are mice that don't have T cells, B cells, or NK cells, so they essentially cannot reject, if you will, the, uh, the transplant, and they serve as an in vivo test tube, essentially. And what they found is that the uh, CLL hematopoietic stem cells are much more able to um, lead to B cells and B cell precursors than normal B cell, than uh, hematopoietic stem cells from normal individuals. Um, in addition, those B cells have a, what appears to be an innate uh, bias to, go, uh, to developing in an oligoclonal fashion if they are part of the CD5 population. Remember, CD5 is a, <clears throat> is a marker protein for CLL. So the CD5 positive B cells coming out of the hematopoietic stem cells of CLL patients are more likely to be oligoclonal monoclonal than those of normal individuals. Um, what's striking, though, is that the clones that develop in this setting are not identical to the clones that come from the patient that donated the bone marrow. So the clones from the patient would have a characteristic Ig VDJ rearrangement, that is the molecular signature of the leukemic clone. The clones that grow out of the mice that came from hematopoietic stem cells, even though they're CD5 positive and monoclonal, do not have these. So what it says is that these cells from the CLL patients have a desire to be B cells, be CD5 positive B cells, and to be clonal, but they're not pre-programmed to start to develop the CLL that the patient eventually develops. There has to be another set of influences that come in, which are probably the promoting events that Jan and Tom will talk to you about. Um, in addition, if you look at the CLL clone, and it, let's say it had a, a characteristic um, 17P deletion, and then you look at this, the B cells that grew out of the mice that came from the hematopoietic stem cells of the CLL patient, they are not present again indicating that these genomic changes are possibly part of the initiating event, but not the earliest event. Um, and this really suggests that what's going on is a, a stepwise uh, um, accumulation of, uh, of genetic abnormalities. And what you see in the mice really sounds like monoclonal B lymphocytosis, right? It's, a, it's a, an expansion of B cells of the CD5 lineage that are not quite leukemic yet. Um, so th this is the, um, uh, the cartoon uh, that the authors uh, show. Um, and what they, what they speculate is that there is a genetic lesion that's occurring at the level of this hematopoietic stem cell, a somatic lesion. And I think that's certainly possible. But I think we need to consider the other possibility. And that is that since we know that there is this inherent predisposition to develop CLL that's seen not only in family members, but also in the, in the general population, albeit to a less uh, frequency, that maybe it's, it's an inherited uh, capacity of hematopoietic stem cells from some individuals that will develop CLL to go down the B cell pathway, uh, the B cell CD5 positive pathway that would expand and then transform. So let's talk now about uh, MBL just briefly. Uh, which is the um, human equivalent of the mouse experiments and what we see as, as uh, practicing physicians. Um, so as you know, uh, if, if we just, first of all, there were no, multiple kinds of MBL, monoclonal B lymphocytosis, some that look like CLL and some that don't. So we're just gonna talk about the ones that look, CL, look like CLL. Uh, they're relatively common, about three to 5% of normal individuals will develop these clones, and about somewhere between 10 to 15% of first degree relatives of CLL patients will develop these clones as well. Um, and there can be a transition at the clinical level from MBL to CLL, which is a basically a numerical definition. 
Um, the numbers of cells, when they cross the threshold for the definition of CLL, are called CLL. Um, um, this occurs in about 1 to 2 percent of the population uh, on a yearly basis. Uh, and it is associated, uh, these changes, with other signals, or uh, other signs, rather, that are similar to what you would CLL, see in CLL. So for example, there's increased tumor burden as the numbers of MBL cells increases. Uh, there are, are the development of specific genomic abnormalities that you could see at the fish level, um, and there is increased lymphocyte doubling time. So those experiments have been done uh, by a number of people. The example here is by uh, Davide Rossi from, uh, from Italy. Um, but there is an in vivo example of this in the same patient. And these are two studies. Initially, the uh, initial study was by uh, Ola Langren uh, uh, from the NIH, and then another uh, study out of, uh, out of Italy, in which they looked at a series of patients who were followed for a totally different reason. Uh, who eventually developed CLL, and they were able to find samples that had been collected many years before on virtually all of these cases. And what they could find, either at the molecular level or at the cellular level, was evidence for uh, monoclonality preceding the CLL uh, diagnosis. Uh, so this is a, not a, a population study, like the one I just mentioned before. This is a study within the same patients, and I think clearly indicates that there are cells that are going this way. Um, what are the abnormalities that one can see in these cells? You know, so what are the initiating abnormalities? And I, as I said before, these are still being defined, so there are probably only a couple of examples of this. Uh, and also, it's highly likely that a given initiating abnormality will not necessarily be present in all patients. So there may be some patients that will have, for example, the, the deletion of these microRNAs, whereas others will not. Um, so we'll, I'm just going to talk about 13Q deletion uh, just for the sake of time, because I think it's actually the best example of how laboratory medicine and clinical medicine agree as far as the ability of a lesion to lead to uh, clonal amplifications. Um, so deletion of 13Q, as you know, is the most common abnormality in CLL. It's seen more often in patients that have mutated IgV genes, so the patients with better clinical outcomes. Um, and George Collin and Carla Croce and their colleagues have shown that one of the uh, a key deletion uh, in this region is the elimination of a, a cluster of two microRNAs, uh, 15A and 16.1. Um, this, I think, was the first documentation that microRNAs can serve as tumor suppressors. Um, and it also suggested that this was a key element in at least a subset of patients, at least, you know, at least probably the mutated uh, case, cases. Um, Ulf Klein and Ricardo Dalla Favre here in New York subsequently created a mouse uh, model in which they were able to delete specifically either the microRNA itself, or this cluster rather, a micro, or the microRNA and an adjacent uh, gene, and not shown here also these two plus even a larger deletion. Um, in all three instances, uh, what they found was that there was a CD5 amplification, CD5 B cell amplification, that depending on the size of the lesion, had greater or less penetrance. So if you deleted just the uh, microRNA, um, you would get an on onset of CLL that was not in the mouse that was not necessarily that frequent, but clearly looked like CLL. If you deleted more than mi microRNA and included the LU2 gene, it was more penetrant. And not shown here, if you deleted this plus a larger area on the chromosome, you got more. So it looks like for some patients then, uh, deletion of these microRNAs will, be, uh, will lead to the, the development of CLL. Probably not the only lesion, probably one of several, but probably a key lesion. So then just to summarize the ideas of development, um, CLL, like other tumors, is primed by, at this point in time, incompletely defined gene variants, some somatic, some not. Um, upon this genetic soil, you get more lesions. Uh, the final, I think this is a key point. The final hit, though, has to occur in a mature B cell. It has to occur in a B cell that has rearranged the VDJ um, genes uh, because the CLL always has that genetic signature. 
Um, so that's where the final hit occurs. How many precede it are unclear. Um, and these composite factors initially play out as MBL and subsequently as CLR. OK, so evolution. Uh, again, standard stuff. You have a tumor, it's going to get worse if the genes, uh, genetic defects get worse. Uh, and there are, again, a number of uh, instances where people have shown this, either at, at the level of acquiring new or more fish abnormalities, uh, or at a more sophisticated level of looking at expression of certain types of genes, like microRNAs, or in whole genome or exome sequencing. And I'm going to just lump this together uh, just to give you the, the general message, uh, because the, again, because of time. Um, so the take-home message is that about 25% of patients will develop a new genetic abnormality over time, and which will occur either in a coding gene or a non-coding gene. Um, this occurs more frequently in people that have unmutated V genes. It occurs in a subset of patients with mutated genes if they are in, more likely if they are the ones that go on to require treatment. Okay? So MCLL has a, a component in which there are clearly uh, genetic variants being generated. Uh, it's also more frequent in patients that are CD38 positive, ZAP70 positive, and 49D positive. The most common new lesion is 13Q minus, uh, and the second most common is 17P, which you know is a very bad uh, outcome gene, abnormality to have. Um, at the level of DNA sequencing, uh, there were, about a year ago, three papers published in rapid succession uh, that looked at sequencing of the exomes of CLL cells. Uh, um, the first two papers listed here uh, studied patients who were not treated, and there was, between them there was a combination of nine samples, that, uh, nine uh, clones that were sequenced. Um, and the, the third uh, study uh, looked at actually 88 patients, some of whom were treated and some of whom were not. Um, I've listed this information that I'm going to tell you about under evolution because it's still not clear whether or not these are actually initiating events or, or progression events. Uh, it's very possible that some of these uh, will turn out to be initiating events, but we just don't know that yet. Um, in sum, what they found were basically four principles. Uh, first is that genomic complexity occurs in CLL. It's not as uh, uh, robust or as frequent as you would see in a solid tumor or in DLCBL. It's probably of the level that you see in AML. Uh, between the three studies at the time, there were 18 uh, um, gene mutations that were defined um, as recurrent. That is, they occurred in more than two patients. Um, and these, uh, some of these were associated with specific abnormalities that had already been known at the fish level, you know, 13Q, 11Q, 17P abnormalities. What's most important, I think, from the standpoint of understanding the consequence of these is that it looks like all of these, based on algorith algorithms that would predict protein structure, virtually all of these look like they will change the function of the protein. So you can envision that there's a selection for this abnormality and that it associates with bad outcome. So I'm not sure how well this projects. I can't see it well here. But uh, what this is showing is uh, from the study by Wang et al. showing associations of certain uh, fish abnormalities uh, and also uh, gene uh, uh, mutations. Uh, so here's uh, a mutation in the p53 gene associated with deletion of 17p. Not surprising. Uh, however, this, these are, here's two examples that are actually very informative. So this is a splicing factor, CF3B1, uh, that is frequently uh, found mutated in these, in these cases, and that's associated with, uh, where was it, <laughs> I lost it, uh, with uh, 11Q. And uh, NOTCH1 also um, is actually the most common mutation event seen in, in the three studies associated with trisomy 12. Um, and in one of the other studies, there was stu the, uh, this particular study by Fabry, the notch mutation was shown to associate significantly with either the development of uh, Richter syndrome or in patients that had chemorefractory disease. Um, and if you look at Kaplan-Meier outcome plots, you can see that notch mutation is uh, um, a bad thing to have. 
So if we summarize this, we can say that 25% of patients will have a new abnormality occur. It's more likely to occur in patients that have ominous, if you will, prognostic markers. Um, key to realize or to, to know that these new abnormalities can occur without treatment. Okay? So it indicates two things. First, that there is a level of diversity that's occurring within the tumor without the influence of treatment. Uh, um, and then the other is that this influence is not just in one subset of patients. You can see it more frequently in the patients with the bad markers, but it occurs in the other patients also, albeit to a smaller fraction. Those patients that have these new abnormalities uh, are treated sooner and have a shorter survival. And you would think then that if you could stop clonal progression that you would probably uh, halt progression of the disease. Okay, so promotion. So as I said, I'm not going to talk a lot about that because Jan and Tom will. Uh, but I would like to just point to one um, issue, and that is what might cause progression. I'm sorry, what might cause promotion? No. How might promotion play out? So in order to get a new DNA lesion uh, at the DNA level as opposed to the epigenetic level, you pretty much have to have cell division. So anything that's going to induce cell division in CLL um, is going to make the cell at risk. And th what you'll hear about are uh, the BCR, CD40, toll-like receptors, and so on. The question is, what, do, what might they be upregulating that would lead to these abnormalities? So what's the mechanism, essentially, of the second level abnormalities that occur in CLL. And what I'd like to suggest is that one of the enzymes that might be responsible for this is an enzyme present in normal B cells that has normal B cell functions called activation-induced cytidine deaminase, or AID. Um, AID is an enzyme in normal B cells that's designed to put point mutations in V genes, and it's designed to make the V gene, I'm sorry, the, the B cell receptor more sculpted, so it's uh, going to be uh, have a higher affinity for specific antigens. And it's also responsible for deleting DNA elements uh, so that you can switch from IgM to IgG production. Okay? So there's a normal biologic functions in B cells that are mediated by this enzyme. There are examples where this enzyme um, uh, has been associated quite closely with progression in tumors. CML is an example, and in other of the lymphoid uh, malignancies, there are examples. So it's not unreasonable to think that this might happen in CLL, because what we see in CLL are predominantly deletions, and then secondarily, we see mutations, as I just showed you. So just very briefly, I'll show you some new data that will appear shortly in blood uh, from uh, Pierre's patent in our laboratory, in which he's been able to identify this AID protein in CLL cells, in particular in cells that are either in tissues uh, or that can be activated in vitro. Uh, this enzyme is upregulated only in cells that divide. Okay? So it's a function of division. And remember, division associates with new DNA abnormalities, and that's, with, and that's what this enzyme can do. So this enzyme would be focused, unfortunately, not only at the V genes, but uh, extra V gene. So it's an off-target abnormality. Um, and lastly, to, again, to associate expression of this particular molecule with outcome, uh, what Pierre's patent did was to look back at a series of patients that we had analyzed AID messenger RNA almost a decade ago um, and looked and saw the outcome of those patients clinically. And what he found was that if the patient had AID, if the patient was more likely to be treated sooner and more likely to die sooner. The other thing that's kind of striking is that in the patients that have uh, mutated genes over here, uh, if you have AID, you're going to do worse than if, you don't have, than, if, than if you don't have AID. So it actually selects out a population of patients in the mutated category that are going to do worse. And by uh, multivariate analysis, AID and, and VG mutations are actually separated. So to, to sum up the last part, um, and developing um, of and completely transformed CLL cells owe their fate to these receptor ligand interactions that you'll hear about shortly. Um, although the survival of these new variants is essential, so there has to be, has to be a rescue event, 
What's primary to this, though, is a proliferative event, because that's when the DNA is being replicated and, and susceptible to ab an abnormality. And therefore, again, the idea of halting the proliferative compartment is something that might be very uh, uh, valuable at the treatment level. Thank you for your attention.